All right, everybody, how you doing? Captain Jack here, and uh, we are on uh, live here on Facebook. I, I do not know why there is no stream going out to YouTube. I do not know why there's no stream to YouTube. Uh, I will have to check the, uh, the OBS on that because there's got to be some glitch. I know that we are, we are here live on Facebook, so... Uh, We'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep it going both here on, on Facebook as well as on Twitter. And I appreciate everybody that's here. Um, we are here tonight with a very well-known and respected offensive lineman uh, from the, originally from the University of Wyoming and Southern California, uh, Mr. Conrad Dobler. Mr. Dobler, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing very good, Captain. Yeah, I... I, I don't know why I'm having a glitch on YouTube, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, I, I will do this video. We're going to push it out via the, uh, the, uh, the Facebook, the Twitter, as well as the Twitch channels, and I will upload it later on. So we'll, we'll definitely make sure that you are included on the YouTube uh, presentation, which we will do. Uh, Mr. Dobler, I, again, I thank you for being here. And in my introduction... I showed that you are a legendary offensive, and I have offensive in, uh, not in italics, but in uh, semi-quotes as a lineman, and I'm sure that uh, you relish the fact that you were a very, uh, I, wanna, I don't want to say, uh, well, actually, I will say this, you were a very feared of, uh, lineman in your day, but before we get to that, how about a little bit of a background uh, of your beginnings in Southern California? Oh, well, I was actually born in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, I came from a large family of uh, seven kids, and my brother that was older than me, he had asthma, so they had to, and my dad worked for Kramer Dairies out in, out in Chicago, and he came out to the desert, which was great for my brother with the asthma, a little town called 29 Palms, California, about 40 miles from Palm Springs, and we were out there for his health problems, and uh, they bought a little food just a little milk distributorship there where, where they still did home delivery. If anyone's my age, don't know what home delivery is from the milk man, but it doesn't happen too much now. And uh, they, uh, that's, that's what they did. And, and I finally uh, played football at the, I went to a Catholic grade school. My eighth grade graduating class was only eight students in that town uh, because it was a small town, but we did have a large Marine base there uh, where they did a lot of maneuvers out in the desert and things, but it was out in the middle of the desert. And of course that was, small school I went to and I ended up getting a uh, going to the high school there and played and the only reason I got on the football was so I didn't have to go home and on little trucks you know the milk trucks and stuff so I did it to uh, get out of work but my dad was smarter than me he left the truck there until I got out of practice so it didn't work out the way I had planned uh, so then I ended up getting a lot of a lot of different scholarships to California schools all over California tell you the truth I had you know, I wasn't, yeah, I, I guess I was a pretty good football player because I won on the other things, but, you know, I wouldn't have gotten all those scholarships if I didn't have a great high school coach that wrote letters and sent out films to a lot of schools. There were a lot of schools in um, in California that wanted me, some big, some small, uh, but I had a girlfriend there that I thought I was in love, and I thought, well, if I go to, you know, if I go to one of these Western Athletic schools like Utah, I had some to Arizona, Arizona State, and I said, uh, then if it's, and if, and if it lasts, my relationship lasts with her, then I'll probably marry her. Well, that, she, it lasted about six months with her. I'm just angry that I didn't get there first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the board, but, so as you see, that wasn't really the way I planned it. Would have been easier on me at that age to uh, uh, have me go first and have her, you know, break up with me because I was uh, cheating on her. But it didn't happen that way. So. I guess I, I'm the type of guy that I always had to play against guys that tried to cheat. There you <laughs> go, see. And wild women. There you go. And and see, there it is. I mean, that says it in a nutshell. If you guys want to know, and by the way, I apologize for those that, that have an echo. Again, I'm having some technical issues here, but I'm not going to forego this interview because I've always wanted to talk to this gentleman mm -hmm. here, based, uh, even from my childhood, you know, based uh, just upon well, reputation. Go ahead, sir. Listen, don't be talking. I see your picture. Don't be talking about your childhood, Captain Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite person. 
<laughs> well, there you go. There, there's another reason why the Captain Morgan Jack in the house. Hey, uh, uh, Conrad, if I may, uh, you told me a story the other day about why you uh, you opted out of uh, the 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 uh, what is it the pack. And I wanted I wanted to ask you if you can relay that story as well because I I found it interesting as to why you didn't stay in California other than that cheating girlfriend shall we say I, oh. it was your uh, the the story you relayed the other day. Well, you know, no, you talk about why did I not go to a California school? Well, yes, first yeah. of all, to be to be completely honest with you, we when as seniors we had to take all those tests, SAT, ACTs, and stuff like that, and. Uh, they offered them to us like two days in a row or three days in a row, and I'm sitting there doing all those tests. And then they said, whoever wants to go to a California university, we have another day of eight hours. And I said, well, I've got all these scholarships someplace else. I don't have to go to a California university. Uh, so I ended up uh, picking Wyoming, which at that time, they had just gotten back from the Sugar Bowl in 1968. And I said, well, if I wanted, I had Arizona, looked at, you know, Arizona, Arizona State, uh, New Mexico, and Wyoming, and uh, I didn't think the Mormons wanted me, so I just didn't get any scholarships to the uh, uh, Utah schools. But uh, I ended up picking Wyoming because they had just gotten back from the Sugar Bowl. They got beaten the Sugar Bowl, but they just got back from the Sugar Bowl. I said, "Well, I'm going to go with someone in this conference. Why don't I go with the? Why don't I go with a winner?" Yeah, and it didn't turn out. It didn't turn out that way. Yeah, I was going to say we made national news in Wyoming. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think I have your years wrong. So you started at Wyoming in '68. Yeah. Okay. Apologies, I, I had it wrong. I because I, uh, I was trying to find uh, any of the bio information, and uh, I know that we discussed the other day about uh, the, what the coach did, and I, I thought you said '67. So I I uh, I I, uh, I put '67. So again, folks, apologies there. '68 to '71 for the University of Wyoming. For uh, Mr. Dobler, and uh, again, right. I didn't. It didn't really turn out like you said that you you went to a powerhouse school, or at least what was a uh, returning powerhouse school. But uh, again, not uh, not so not so much when you were there. Well, not only that, but you know, to be honest with you, when I got there, I was I was you know thought I was pretty much of a hot shot because of that. Um, but when I got there, we had a ninety-two freshmen on full rides because a big rancher or somebody in Wyoming picked up all the in-state scholarships so they didn't have to uh, claim those, you know, to stay within the rules and, and uh, you know, and of course in Wyoming at that time, a lot of students still played eight-man football. But uh, I went there because they had just gotten back from the Sugar Bowl and that's why I said if I'm going to go with I had a scholarship to Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, Utah, in Utah State, and I thought, well, if I'm going to go to the school, I may as well go to the school that's the champion, and that was the University of Wyoming at that time. I didn't foresee what was going to happen a year later. Did you lose, uh, I guess, did they lose a lot of the, the senior and junior talent? Oh, actually, back then, juniors couldn't opt for the NFL. So I guess, did they lose a lot of the, the senior and junior talent anyway? No, what had happened is, um, well... You know, that, that was kind of difficult time for the whole country, 1968, 1969, uh, with the racial unrest. And uh, we had 14 black players on the team. And uh, the, the Black Student Alliance, they wanted to wear black armbands to protest uh, the way they were treated or whatever. It's not at the school, but everyone. It was a big racial attack thing in 1968. And they showed up at the practice, and the head coach was very conservative and uh, very dictatorial, and he said uh, they, they did it right. They wanted to imagine if he would mind if they wore black armbands or if they wore black armbands during the game. And he told them the way he protested, and we were playing Brigham Young, which didn't allow any blacks in the ministry. They wanted to wear them against Brigham Young. And the way our coach said, the way you demonstrate is you go out there and you tip the hell out of those people from Utah, and that's how you demonstrate. And, but you're not going to use my field, a, a, a public field, for a protest because this field is for football, it's not for protesting. And they showed up the next day with back armbands on 14 and kicked them off the team. It was called the, the Black 14. And of course, so every time we would go to play, whether Arizona or Arizona State, there was always a big black student alliance, you know, picketing our bus and, you know, shouting stuff at us. And Bobby Higgins, I didn't have to play against those guys. The guys aren't playing against them in the stadium, not outside the stadium. And uh, it was uh, it was quite something. Uh, 
at that particular time. You had Vietnam going on, then you had racial unrest in America. So it was a uh, tough time for any 18, 19 year old kid to go through that. Okay, well, I mean, well, that, that, and, that... And, and you want to know what? And we lost most of the kids, to be honest with you. We lost, there was a lot of young white players that would have never played. They all got a chance to play because we lost some great talent. You know, when they all decided to quit. Well, and, you know, some of the old guys, years later, I talked to them years later, and they said, well, to tell you the truth, we would have threatening phone calls and everything else if we didn't go out there and do that. So we just thought we would do it. And unfortunately, uh, they did it at a very conservative area in Wyoming. You know, if I was a coach, I wouldn't care if, if they wore black armbands or pink armbands. Just show up. <laughs> right. But I wasn't the, when I wasn't the coach, it was a different time. And, and, 68 and 69 and stuff like that, uh, Vietnam and everything else like that. Well, and, and as you said, it was, it was it afforded opportunity for people that may, might not have gotten it otherwise. Yeah. So, oh, it, yeah, we, 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 in fact, we actually, the staff actually stood up a male cheerleader because he could snap the ball long. And all he did was come to practice for like a half hour or so and he just snapped the ball, and my very my roommate, very good friend of mine, Jim Eastlack, he's a big time executive with Atlantic Richfield Oil. He lives in Alaska now. But his job was to keep hitting this guy after he snapped the ball, so he'd get used to it. And I'd look over at him, and he'd look at me and he said, Hey, the coach, you want to be a knock us out each time? And I looked at him and said, Well, how's your fur? Is it kind of sore right now? <laughs> Well, but those are some things we had to go through, and you know they, you know, you, you try not to think about it, and you know, but once the game started, you got to understand one thing: you better go out there and play because there's no place to hide on that field. That's right. That's right. Now, uh, again, in where you were playing in the uh, now you were playing in at, at the time it was the WAC, correct? Yeah, Western Athletic Conference, right? Okay. Uh, what, were there any particular players of note that played within the conference that you that you remember uh, uh, amongst all others? Well, you know, I, I can remember some from the University of Wyoming. I, you know, I thought you know Mark Arneson, who played for the was drafted with the Cardinals the same year. I was the linebacker for Arizona State or Arizona. I think it was Arizona, right? And he was there, and another guy who played for Utah, but. Uh, I, and yeah, he wasn't a very good player, but uh, anyway, there were some players from the different conferences that made it there. And of course, you know, when I when I went there as a veteran that time, they used to hate rookies and stuff. And and I had Deardorff and Tom Banks. Deardorff went to Michigan. Tom Banks went to Auburn. And I had all these big time school guys. And believe it or not, I was like the only rookie there, and I was not treated all <laughs> well by staff. I, I think that's what turned me. I thought that all football players were a bunch of jerks, so I just considered the guys that I was playing against the same way. <laughs> well, and, and I like that. The fact that we we are uh, in a, a psychological way, we're we're getting into the 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 psyche of what turned you into uh, your your I should say the reputation that ensued in uh, for your playing career. And uh, so, well, you know, that, that reputation came by the people I was playing against that, uh, you know, when the press would interview them, they would talk about what type of a-hole I was and that I would do this and I would do that. So the thing is, then the newspaper kept coming back and asking me and I was saying, hey, man, I, I'm just playing the game. I'm knocking people down. I'm, I'm playing until the whistle blows. See, I would just block my guy. And if it was a pass, I'd run down the field and try to knock someone else down. So I ended up with that re reputation as the... Um, as I got to the NFL, and when I got to the NFL, I'm from Wyoming, and on the offensive line, we had Tom Banks from Auburn, we had a guy from Florida, Roger Finney, we had Dirtle from Michigan, and, uh, and these guys, uh, you know, that, back then, that's when hazing was really big. And I just kept my head down and my mouth shut, and uh, to tell you the truth, I was cut on the last cut of the season, the last cut of the exhibition season. I was without a game, without a team, and uh, I hadn't even gotten out of, uh, of St. Louis. I hadn't even looked for an apartment. And they played that game, and then they went out to Chicago and played someone in the second game. And he, one guy on the offensive line got hurt, and they called me back. So I was only gone for two games. Then I came back, and I ended up starting in the fourth game of the year. We had a lot of injuries and finished out the entire year with the, with the uh, first string and stuff. And, uh, and the rest of the story has been written. <laughs> 
Well, I, and I was going to. I wasn't going to get cut again. Oh, and you know what? Just like just like the Who sang, won't get fooled again. And I do have yeah. I do have it on the screen, uh, drafted in the fifth round, a uh, 110th pick. And I was going through the uh, who was in your draft class, and I was looking. I said, well, and, and don't spoil the don't spoil what I'm going to say in a minute because a lot of people don't know this. But I was looking through, and I'm like. Yeah, you were you were probably the the best person out of that draft class. And then I looked again and I reread who was drafted in the first round by the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, some guy by the name of Bobby Moore. So uh, well, at that at that time, he you know he actually changed his name uh, a couple of years later to Ahmad Rashad. There you so go. Known him as Ahmad Rashad. Right, right. And of course, of course, you want to know the owners in St. Louis just couldn't understand that. You know, right now in this day and age, everyone would understand someone wanted to do that. But back then, they thought he was psycho something was psychologically wrong with him. It was funny, and you know, I'm talking to Ahmad. He said, "Yeah." They wouldn't have had me see psychiatrists and stuff like that. They just didn't understand where I was coming from. But I thought that was kind of amusing. Yeah, I, and that's why I had to look again. I said, well, of that 72 class, you were definitely – the uh, the best player on there, and then and like I said, then I looked again. I said, "Oh, Bobby Moore." I said, "I know who that. I know who that is. That's Ahmad Rashad." So again, yeah, and yeah. So you know, I was drafted in the fifth round, and uh, I was the only fifth round draft choice out of that class that even started as a rookie, and then ended up making the Pro Bowl. And uh, I just thought, uh, you know, as as I kind of told Bidwell to those guys later in life when I'd go out and do some engagement stuff with them. I would say, you know, you guys have me really stupid. I meant that you drafted me in the fifth round and all those other people you drafted in front of me, you just gave them the money and they just didn't make the team. And I said, uh, I should have been a second round draft choice. And he said, well, let me tell you something, Conrad. You were still there in the fifth round. <laughs> <laughs> no one else took you. So what makes you think I should have taken you in the first round? I, I think that was Mr. Bidwell's way of saying uh, touche. Yeah, well, you know, that's too bad because they actually predicated your income or your salary on what position of the draft you were drafted in. Right, right. I remember I got a, I got a $5,000 bonus and uh, I think 18500 $18, in the first year. And I got a bunch of, you know, things that I paid on special things that they did or that. You know, you, you got, you know, they spoke $500 or something like that. But uh, when you're a young 21-year-old kid in the, in the end of the 60s, 18000 plus $5,000 bonus, you know, that adds up to a lot of money. Unfortunately, what the thing you learn your rookie year is that you didn't really make that money because the IRS took part of it. Right, right. Now, you actually brought up Mr. Bidwell, and, and uh, I don't want to get you in trouble, but uh, I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm not going to ask. Ask anything that's really bad. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, anything you want to know. What's Mr. Bidwell going to do? Take my birthday away? <laughs> that, and that is why I have you on, because again, I can pretty much ask you anything and you're going to let me know. Uh, Mr. Bidwell did have a reputation. If I, tell you, if I tell you the truth, I always remember what I said. If I lie, I'm kind of. Have to go through the tape and find out where I lied. <laughs> and that's true. It's easier to keep uh, keep track of the truth than all the lies you can tell. Right. Now, Absolutely, when you get older, too. Now, Mr. Bidwell did have a reputation for being cheap, and uh, obviously, that's probably one of the reasons why he uh, he exited from uh, the St. Louis area. Eventually, I guess uh, cheap owners go go well in uh, in St. Louis because they had it done done to him twice. Although Cronky's not cheap, he's just exor exorbitant. But that's that's another that's another thing in, at matter. Uh, how did you get along with uh, with with Mr. Bidwell, and, and also maybe some of the other players? And I'll go through them. In fact, who were your favorites among, on on the team that you played with in, in St. Louis? Well, of course, with Dan Gerdorf, and you know, tell you we were a pretty tight group. We had we had. Uh, Ernie McMillan on the one tackle, and then when he retired, he played for 15 years or something. We had a guy by the name of Roger Finney out of Florida A&M, I believe, and, and he was a great guy. Didn't say, hey, didn't say anything. I mean, very seldom you get a conversation. When you get a conversation going with him, he'd get excited and start to stutter a lot and stuff like that. But he was a, or 
you know, we just didn't understand what he was saying. He, he was a great guy. He loved the guy. He was, you know, take a bullet for him. And of course, we had Tom Banks from Auburn and uh, Dan Durda from Michigan. And we had another guy from Ohio State, Chuck Hutchinson, which was playing a guard position. And he didn't make it. And of course, we had Bob Young, who was the strongest man in the NFL. Now, this guy weighed 200 and maybe 305 pounds and could run a 4 six forty. I mean, but he was short. Maybe I, I don't know how he did it, but he was fast, man. Fast. And he was the strongest man in the NFL at one time. Yeah. Uh, he would go in the, in the, into the weight room and start warming up with the bench press at 235 pounds. And that was by that with a cigarette in his mouth. And that was my biggest lift. Actually, going through the, uh, Going through the pictures, and I, I I collected my old football card, so I was like, oh, I remember that guy, and I look, and Bob was sixty four, and I said, I and I remember him from the football cards, and then I looked at the uh, the center fifty four, and I says, yeah, that's Tom, Tom something, and I had to go back, and and then I heard, then it was like a Tom Banks, correct? Tom Banks went to Auburn. Yeah, yes, sir. And, uh, then we had Jackie Smith that went, went some redneck net college down in, I don't know where it was, Louisiana, I think. Yeah. And uh, and Jackie Smith was the tight end. So, you know, I had some pretty pretty well-known people around me. I played right next to Dan Dirdo, which I had Dan on one side and Tom Vince on the other side. In fact, um, you know, uh, everyone kind of laughed about us at the time, but we set a record that I don't think will ever be broken in the NFL as an offensive line. We went through an entire season and only allowed eight quarterback sacks. Now, get this. Two of them, two of those sacks were not even our responsibility. They were the back that was supposed to pick up the outside linebacker if he, if he was coming in. And they'd run past them to, out to the flat to throw me the ball or something like that. But they, they didn't pick those guys up. So we ended up getting two, two sacks from our backfield with missed assignment. You know, we were all covered. We had people on us covered. And I'll tell you what. Those guys took a lot of abuse from us because we were, you know, one year we went through one year with 16 sacks. The next year, I think we had 15. And then we set the record at eight. And one, one of the sacks, and we tried to get it removed, was a bad snap, snap on an extra point. And the guy had to cover it up. They weren't going to touch him. And we weren't, we weren't even on the extra point team, but they still charged that against the offensive line. So in reality, we went through the season only allowing seven sacks, but the record's eight, which is ours. But that was because... We weren't even in the game on that back end. Yeah. I mean, we put this, we put this in the NFL and they wouldn't remove it. What's the big deal? I mean, it's not, why won't you remove that? I guess they didn't have a category to put that down any place that the, that the guy sat the uh, holder, which was Roger Worley. I mean, there was no quarterbacks involved. I said, the fault doesn't line the bubbly, but that's the way it was. So we, the record's eight sacks and, I don't think it was, people got close. Miami got close one year, but they didn't make it. They ended up with ten or twelve. Now, were you there for the? Uh, and maybe uh, I, I'm getting the years wrong. Were you there for the transition from Jim Hart to? Uh, uh, oh, guy, I'm not. Yeah, you know, I just brain farted. The, the guy Neil Lomax, or was that after you? No. Uh, let's see. When I when I was there, they brought in Gary Quago as a backup. There you go. And Jim Van Gelder as a backup. And Jim Hart, and you know, I'll be honest with you, the only reason Jim Hart set a lot of those records and stuff, he was a good quarterback, but he never got sacked. And uh, we had Mel Gray as receivers. We had some great receivers, Jackie Smith at tight end. And Jackie, that was a tough son of a bitch, man. I'm sorry, son of a gun. And, uh, no, no, he, let, he it, let it fly. Let it fly, Conrad. You know, he, was, he was great to play with because, you know, he didn't take the tight end to go out there and get drunk and, you know, uh, with us, we didn't want to. We didn't want to start fights, but sometimes they happen. <laughs> there you go. And I think it's unfortunate yeah. that the only thing or I shouldn't say the only thing, but the most memorable thing that Jackie is remembered for is later on as a as a cowboy is dropping a touchdown in a Super Bowl, and he had a Hall of Fame career despite that. So it's kind of unfortunate that that's what they remember him for. I think he, he he's in the Hall of Fame now, isn't he? I, I believe so. Yeah, uh, he did. Yeah, I think I went. To, I think I went to his induction. I believe so. I think he went for his in induction, but they made him wait a few years just because of that. And that and, sucks. And I, I think the press votes on most of the Hall of Fame, and you know when all they remembered about Jackie, you know a lot of these press guys and stuff is that he dropped the winning pass in the in the Super Bowl. Right, and, and that. 
that's unfortunate. I can't what team he was playing for, but uh, yeah, it was, a, it was it was a Cowboys you know, Steelers Super Bowl. Yeah, and you know what I told I told I told those guys what was, they were talking about. I said, well, he's going to be remembered forever. I said, besides, who remembers the guy that catches a pass in the Super Bowl one? But the winning touchdown pass to drop it in the end zone. He's going to be remembered forever, and that's, you know, that's, that's what he needs. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, see, unfortunately, because he dropped the pass, the Steelers ended up winning four. But, that I mean, they, they, that's, did, they did end up winning. That's, that's absolutely correct. But yeah. God bless him, man. He, he's a, and he's a good guy, man. Good guy. You got, know? And he dropped the pass in the Super Bowl, and they forget about the 200 passes he caught during the entire season. And there you the go. Way, that's the way it is. Yeah, and that 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 is unfortunate. Now, and another thing that was unique with the fact that you were playing for the Cardinals way back when, folks. For those that don't know, the Cardinals were in the mm-hmm. NFC East, so they had a chance to play the Eagles and the Cowboys and the Giants each year. So what what were yeah, the- I, you know? I I always thought that was a tough conference. We had to play the Giants twice, the Cowboys twice, the Washington Redskins twice, the Philadelphia Eagles twice. And then, uh, who, who did I leave out? The Cardinals and the Giants. And the yeah. Giants twice. So, uh, that was a, that was a tough, tough conference. You know, I, I'd like to go back and find out how many, how many Super Bowl teams that were from that conference actually played in the Super Bowl. But that, that was a very difficult conference because all the time, those, those teams that were in our conference, there would always be somebody in the playoffs. There are some conferences that don't get anyone in the playoffs, but, uh, you know, this playoff game. There, there were always one of those teams from that, those teams of that conference that ended up getting to the playoffs or had an opportunity to play in the Super Bowl. Yeah, like I said, said you had those, you know, the, the Eagles team, you know, under Vermeil, obviously Landry and his right. boys, uh, the Redskins uh, after George Allen. George Gibbs, was it Gibbs? I think it was Gibbs that put him there. He was coaching St. Louis, Joe Gibbs. Wow! Oh, yeah, yeah, so uh, now he was uh, an off he was an offensive line coach, wasn't he? No, Jim Hamilton was an offensive line coach. Joe Gibbs coached the uh, running back in St. Louis. There you go. Okay, yeah, that I knew you had some really good coaches there from that tree. Oh, we had, hey, you want to know what? And they were the first ones, uh, first time I played. In fact, all of us in Europe and stuff. Hey, you know, they sort sit around and sometimes uh, after a hard practice of it at camp. They had to catch the beer in the locker room, and they, they would all sit at the and drink it with us. I mean, we would go out to dinner, there and myself would have them, usually the night before the game, uh, go to a nice restaurant with my wife and his wife and Dan's wife, which neither one of those women are married to anything anymore. But, <laughs> but we went out to dinner, and uh, we, were, we were really close. We, were, we enjoyed the hell out of it. And, uh, man, that, I think that's what really made us a team. Is Corio was such an easy coach to play for in the sense that he respected everybody. I don't care. You know, Hanson was the kind of guy, if he was going to cut a guy that afternoon, he'd be working with him on his stamp and his, his get off and his pass protection that morning. I mean, these were truly great coaches. We had Joe Gibbs. We had uh, Joe Gibbs as the backfield coach. Don Coriel, Jim Hannafin. Uh, we had a Harry. Harry, what was his name? Harry. Uh, you know, he was an All-American at someplace down in Tennessee. Can't remember his last name. But we had out of that coaching staff, and of course, they didn't have the coaching staff that they had today because Bidwell wouldn't let them hire all those people. Right. But uh, I think out of the seven coaches we had, I think. Uh, Five or six of them ended up being head coaches at other teams. Right. That's how good, that's how good of a, a, a man uh, Don Coriel was. And why uh, he's not his, why he's his, not in the Hall of Fame is, I mean, when you think about Don Coriel, you actually think, obviously, uh, the beginnings in St. Louis with, with him, and then, of course, him in San Diego with the Chargers with Air Coriel, and the guy is not in the Hall of Fame is, is another travesty. So, Raider fans, you're not the only one that should have more people well, in the Hall of Fame. You know, I think with the, uh, you know, let's put it this way. If you don't play in a Super Bowl for the winning team or the losing team, your statistics of making the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame are very, very diminished. You know, for some reason, they weigh that game more than anything else because you can go through a lot of losing people. Most of the coaches and players that have made the Hall of Fame, a lot of them have played in the Super Bowl. 
Yes. So that's just the way it goes. That's just the way it goes. Yeah. Now I'm gonna. I'm we got, gonna. We got, we, we got close a lot, close a lot of times, but uh, we. Uh, the sad thing about St. Louis is we just really sucked on defense. We had, and you know, I've got some friends that played on defense, but uh, they they were bad. And 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 if they don't, they, I mean, we we would have to score 40 points a lot of times to to, to win the game. Right. <laughs> so does that tell you anything? They call us a high scoring offense. No, we needed those points. <laughs> well, right. I mean, like, like you said, you know, you remember the offensive players that the Cardinals have. Like I said, you mentioned Jackie Smith, Mel Gray, Terry, the great Terry Metcalf as well. Yeah, the offensive yeah. line was was standout. Jim Hart was a, a all pro quarterback several years going. So you guys had the the machine on offense, but it was like uh, you you just had to outscore people, like you said, in order to win. Oh yeah, we you know we knew if we were behind by six points or seven points, if we got the ball with two or three minutes left, that we could we could score. And so did the other teams, but our defense would <laughs> they couldn't stop anyone. And I, I, I hate to say that, you know why why that was? Because I'll tell you what, because that practice, you know, and Coriel came from you know college, so they used to practice hard all the time. That if, you know. And, and professional football, a lot of times, you, you know, two, two days a week, you go out there and show the pads and shorts with your helmet. Uh, but uh, it was contact all the time. So they didn't, uh, wherever I going with this story, they didn't, um, well, like I said, we, uh, Corio just came in and was refreshing. He didn't believe, and we very seldom did sprints afterwards. You know, Hannafin made us, uh, offensive line coach, we would do some, but, you know, we weren't setting the world on fire. The Olympics were not looking at us as sprinters. And but Coriel didn't believe in any of that. He didn't believe in a lot of contact. He, you know, if he, if he lost a player at training camp or, you know, during practice off some injury, he was very angry about that. He didn't like, you know, he really took care of his players. And he had a team of coaches around it. Harry Gilmore, um, you know, Jim Hannafin, Joe Gibbs. Don Coryell and all these coaches went on to uh, become the head coaches and, and things of that nature. Yeah, and and I so, said you know, it, it was it was I, I I remember trust me I remember the Cardinals and uh, now I got I do have to ask as well and I got a lot of pictures of you uh, uh, in the uh, here showing uh, with Merlin Olson. Now apparently there was a, a big beef between you and Merlin. Oh, I didn't have any beef. Uh, no, I didn't have any beef whatsoever. Uh, I meant, uh, we played the Rams in a playoff game. I believe they won the game. They did. And uh, and it was a playoff game. And I I just played my normal game. And he was a little bit older. I had a hell of a game. Because I actually kicked his ass. Okay? Basically, it was an ass kicking for him. And, uh, and then when I said it, it Hopefully, you know, I can finish the job. Hopefully, hopefully he won't retire. We'll get a chance to play him again. And I'll be damned if it wasn't the next year we got to play him again. And I really did a number on him. But he said in the paper, if he ever had a Vegas day again, he'd break my neck. So I was just playing the ref and tough, hoping I didn't break my neck. That's the truth. I was trying to break his neck. <laughs> well, and, and... Of, course, I, I, of course, I went to Wyoming and he went to Utah. So that was another reason I didn't like him. There you go, because you, you had the same tough upbringing as well. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of, um, I lived out in the desert, and, you know, the only reason I got into football, I went to a Catholic school, like I said, grade school, which my eighth grade graduating class was only eight students, and to be thrown into a freshman class in high school at, you know, 145 students just in the freshman class, and I didn't know anyone there. We lived, you know, kind of outside the city, so we never walked to people's houses and stuff. So um, we had an institution of food distributorship. While we did, you know, work, there were times when I was on the track team. I'd run up, uh, I'd show up at the track team, change the back of the truck, run my event, and get back in my truck and finish my route. Uh, but uh, that's just the way we were brought up. And looking back at it, you know, I, I tried to, you know, think it was like child abuse, but they would. It, it helped me, you know, because if any coach or anything, you know, a lot of times they try to run people off. Like when I was a freshman at Wyoming, we had 115 people on full rides. And when I left uh, my senior year, there were, I think, nine of us left out of 145. 
Well, again, the, the, it just shows that you are you are thorough and just could stick stick with it. Now, I got to ask because again, it's going it, to we got to get it through we got to get it done anyway. Uh and I'm gonna, I'm going to hold off on on Dan Deardorff because I know he's a dear friend of yours. I'm going to hold off on that until a certain uh slideshow later on. But what necessitated Sports Illustrated calling you the dirtiest or nastiest guy in football? You know, I really don't know because, uh, you know, I, I did a, you know, I was a pretty good talker. And as a, as a sportscaster, you know that you get a guy in the show that will answer your questions with two words, and that's killing you. All you're trying to do is get, you know, get it to the next break and keep it interesting for your uh, audience. But some of that will answer the question with just one word or two words. You're wondering, you're looking at your director and you're saying, who booked this guy? Do you, you know, I want to kill you. You know, punch yourself out so I can find you at the show so I can beat the hell out of you. But anyway, besides that, um, I even forgot what the question was now. What, 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 what do you think necessitated Sports Illustrated calling you the, the dirtiest player in football? Well, I don't know. The thing is, they did the interview. And that's what I was, I was You know, every time I get to this point, I've been interviewed before. I forget that's what I was talking about. I don't know why. Because it's not a bad feeling with me, but uh, you know, I didn't think it was a big deal. I never, I never followed sports. I couldn't name anybody on any other team when I got there. And Europe and Tom Banks and stuff that you know grew up with professional football. Hey, I grew up in a town where we only had one channel on TV, and it was snowy. You know what I'm saying? So that's how you know that's how I grew up. But we had these uh, black and white too, so the snow really you know, blocked out the games and stuff. But we didn't see a lot of games out there. In Southern California uh, at that time, and of course, they weren't really televised as much as they are now. Uh, so, going into it and stuff, when I didn't know that Sports Illustrated was such a big deal, I was on other covers like you know local magazines and stuff like that. And New York and Tom Banks thought that that was crazy that I had no idea how 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 important that is. So the nice thing about it, I've been able to make a lot of copies of it, and when I Go and do some engagements, speaking engagements, and things of that nature. Uh, talk to a lot of audience. I, I make them, I have a lot of those copies of sports shows straight up, and I'm able to sign those. And that I feel is something worth saying for these people. It's kind of neat that I'm able to do that. Well, I definitely, if I ever get a chance to see you at a signing, sir, or or I'll get with you off off offhand. I, I will definitely pay for one of those because, again, as a, as a you don't have to pay for them. I, I don't charge people. In fact, I, I still get maybe 10, 15, 10 to 12 to 15 uh, letters a week that they send me those little bubblegum cards and stuff. Oh, yeah. I sign, those. I sign and send them back. I God bless those guys, you know. So I send them, you know, I just use the bubblegum cards and put clothes, clothes things on my spokes with my wheels. On my bicycle, maybe some of the motorcycle. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I, I used to do those too, but uh, I was actually more of a card collector, so I would make sure that I never had my primary cards there. It was always my doubles. I didn't care about my doubles. Yeah, well, you know, it's amazing. I look back and I, I didn't know much about collecting cards, but I probably had, you know, through the years, you, you think back when you were a kid, I probably had some goody cards that are people spending a lot of money on today that, uh, you know, I probably used them for. You know, wrote on with the Mark Magic Mark and make a deck of cards out of them. Playing, you know, it's a with card game. So, you know, I, I look at all of them and say, man, I had hundreds and hundreds of them. And I just, you know, I, I went, I, I tell you, I went back to the house I was raised in, which we still own, and I went up into the attic area and I went through a lot of boxes to see if there were any cards in there. Yeah, I was gonna say the the fact that you were growing, yeah, the, the fact that you were growing up in the in the fifties and sixties, you bring you bring those original tops and flair out, you know, and and even the the I think they had Bauman and and Gowdy back then as well. You bring those cards out now, prior to the explosion uh, that they had in the in the eighties, where now cards are a dime a dozen, but you get those old cards now, they're actually worth quite a lot. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a lot stuck up in the attic at the old house and stuff like that, but uh, I I don't live out in 29 pounds anymore, and, and I'm too old to get up in an attic and crawl around. So hopefully, if someone uh, if someone buys the house, they'll you know they'll come up with a nice gift and say it'll go up there. Well, I don't know what's up there. Anyway. So, you know, I never went up there. So it's probably 
30, 40, I don't think anyone's ever been up there. <laughs> it, if you give me the address, I'll find a Marine to go up there for you there. Uh, oh, yeah. we used to, we used to, they, they were great, the Marines, because we, uh, we used to always uh, help them out with, you know, part-time jobs, loading trucks, unloading the trucks and things of that nature. Some of them stayed with us after they were uh, released from the service and uh, ended up being employees of ours. But uh, good guys, the Marines were big guys. Yeah. Um, the, the funny story, I gotta just tell you a funny story. Uh, we were out, and of course, like I said, I was in high school, so we were out in the hot sun doing it. with a couple of Marines with our two with us working out in the yard raking and stuff. We had a pretty big piece of property, and uh, we had a lot of trucks. And um, we had beers afterwards, and before the flip top cans, you had to use a chemical. We didn't have one, just one third day. Took a knife on it, so I had to open it, turn it over, stuck that knife in there, and that knife went through his thumb, damn the head off. He didn't even stop the rapid. He just kept drinking. <laughs> and 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 therein what that is a true marine story. I got a a bunch of uh, a couple people here that are uh, veterans as well. I'm I'm old Navy, and we already had the the, the banner about Marines and Navy. I got a, a Air Force guy that always pops in. But yeah, got gotta love gotta love your corpsman. And I mean, well, uh, yeah, no, I, I used to always like to because the Navy guys ran all the hospitals and stuff out there in 29 Palms, California, where uh -huh. I grew up. And and I used to say to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the sailors uh, uh, and stuff, you say, now aren't you guys part of the Marines? And they go, no, the Marines are part of us. <laughs> there you go. And and then they then the Marine will say, yeah, the men's department of the department. Yeah, of the, the men's department. Absolutely correct. So, you know, they're, they're good guys. They're just kind of fun out there, and, uh, and you know, without sixty eight and stuff, that was you know, right. You know, I, I, near the, near the and stuff with the uh, in Vietnam. Right. Yeah. You. 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 De like I said, you definitely had some uh, good good times out there for sure. And of course, the Marines didn't once they hit the Nam. But that's a different story. Hey, uh, Conrad, I am going to transition now, and I and I, I hate doing it. Uh, do you? By the way, do you need a break? Do I need a break? Well, I have a glass of water here, and I've got a sandwich next to me. I'm going to eat when I get done, and. Uh, I'm just up visiting my daughter right now and some of my grandkids. Well, I, I appreciate uh, you spending time really with busy us. I'm going to start getting really busy because I do flu shots for large corporations around the country. Uh, and uh, we do a lot of that. And if I get a chance, I'll put up my phone number out there. But uh, i got to start lining up the nurses and getting the vaccine bought and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but I've been doing it for years. So, you know, after you get to do it for years, it gets to be kind of easy. Gotcha. But, uh, but, you know, the only problem I have is you always have to worry about will the nurse show up? Because I do them all over the country, so I can't be there. So uh, I worry about that. And you know, tell you the truth, they've all showed up. I've never had one not show up. Well, we'll, we'll definitely get to your, your post-career uh, in a little bit. I, I want to move on to uh, Nolens, and I'm saying it the way that they would say it down south. What What drove you... To uh, to come to New Orleans following a, a very uh, renowned career in uh, St. Louis. Well, we didn't have no say over that stuff. If you follow what I'm saying, I was traded. I was traded because um, oh well, I think it might have been the problem that I had is you know I had played in three Pro Bowls and one offseason and one of the people like you called me and said, uh, well, "What do you think of Mr. Bidwell?" Uh, you know, I just said, "I just think that." Uh, he keeps all his money in his fat belly, and uh, he has no respect for men, and he's never played the game at all, and yada, yada, yada. And the way he treats people, I said, I, would, I wouldn't think it would shock me if he traded me or Deirdre. And Bill <laughs> said, well, when the press is saying this, that's him. Well, he said, it wouldn't shock him if he traded over. And he, and he said, well, if he wants to be traded so bad, I'll trade him. And he shipped me down to New Orleans, which at that time had never won more than four games in their complete franchise history. And we won seven and nine, and then we won eight and eight. And when we won eight and eight, you would have thought it was Mardi Gras was starting again. Oh. Uh, because they never had one of down there. Most games they ever won before I went down there were like three games in the entire season. That was their, the best record they've ever had. I think. They didn't, it could have been four games, but it was dismal. Now you were now Archie was still playing back then, correct? Archie was a great guy, great, great human being, wonderful man, loved him, and and you know, tell you what, he appreciated us because the year before I got there, I think they were sacked sixty-eight times, and when I was there, he was sacked 
17 and 18, and I think we won the record for the least amount because we won it five years in a row in St. Louis for allowing the least amount. That we went through a season one time, only allowed eight sacks the entire season. And what's bad is they, we had two bad snaps on an extra point, and the holder had to cover it up, and the guy went over there and touched him, and they, we weren't even in the game. A lot of us thought that when, and the, the NFL charged it against our offensive line. So we went through the entire season over, only giving up six sacks other than the two on the extra point that the NFL would. So the record's eight sacks, and I don't think that'll ever be broke. No, I, I, I definitely think that you got that one in the bag there, Mr. Dober. Now, who were, who were your uh, line mates in, in New Orleans? Well, I had John Hill, who just recently died, uh, an offensive tackle by the name of Watson, another guy by the name of, uh, I can't remember his name. His name was, uh, uh, he was a uh, African-American uh, short and stumpy. And I can't remember what his name is. And he was, he was the captain of the, soul, uh, of the team, too. And, of course, we had a guy that had Watson. Uh, John Hill was a veteran in New Orleans. And, oh, the other guard who was the guy I couldn't remember. John Hill was a veteran. He was a good guy. He just recently passed. And uh, yeah, we had fun. And we 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 led the league in the least amount of that. They had 58 sacks the year before I got there. And we went through the season with 16. That's awesome. So, and the next year, I think we had like 17 or something. And we won it two years in a row while we there. And they traded me to Buffalo. And guess what? We won it in Buffalo. Well, and that's post uh, that's post electric company because they've always had good offensive linemen in Buffalo. So you were just part of that as well. Yeah, we didn't have we didn't have OJ Simpson in the background, and uh, but I'll tell you what, Joe Ferguson just loved us because he was used to being sacked thirty times, and I was the only guy that they brought in that was different than another guy. And uh, we all got together and said, "Hey, you know, the offensive linemen, you know, no one ever gave a damn about." Us. We could make a thousand great blocks in a game, and they'll never say you're a great blocker. But you know, a, a defensive lineman, he can make one tackle, and all of a sudden he's a hero of the game. <laughs> now, what was it like for uh, blocking for Chuck Muncy? And obviously, this was before Chuck had some of his issues. But uh... well, yeah, well, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck's a good guy, a good guy, and you know, the, the, you know, the issues are issues, and everyone has them. And, what the, some people would handle him different than other people, but Chuck was Chuck was a nice man. You know, he didn't, um, he, you know. And to be honest with you, when I first got down there, and I realized that uh, um, the locker room was split in St. Louis by racial, and I thought, you know, we got all these lockers over here, and it was just all black guys, and all these lockers over here, it's all white guys. I picked the locker room when the black guy side and the white guy kind of looked at me and I went and told the coach said, you know, said this is bullshit, man. <laughs> We're in the 70s, getting ready to go into the 80s. I said, what you do is you, you don't get you get rid of the rows and just take one long one. So it's got to be in the same row. And uh, they said, oh, we didn't really even think about that. I, and I was amazed that why wouldn't they have thought about it? And it was probably because they were down in New Orleans, and that's the way it's done in New Orleans. And you didn't even keep it that way, but uh, I, I, I did my part. Well, that you see know, again, we, we became a pretty, we became, became a pretty tight group. In fact, we used to go out uh, all together at uh, for dinner on a Friday night. The offensive linemen would all meet up at you know one of the nice restaurants downtown with our wife and stuff, and have dinner. And uh, it was it was a, it was a great thing, you know. It was kind of neat and. I kind of think that a lot of the running backs and stuff that were African American were kind of looking at the offensive line and saying, well, well, why are you guys all together? Why wouldn't you be? Yeah, it's it's a you had your group together. That that's what it was. It yeah, was. I, I, I was just never brought up with with any of that. Uh, I, I never realized that stuff went on. I mean, because I had a lot of African American friends, of, you know, and a lot of them. Well, not a lot of them, but you know. And I have to I have to give credit to when I grew up I grew up around two you know a few of them, but the thing is they all had military parents and uh, so I can't say they were just great guys because they had great parents you know I you know they I'm sure they none of them got into trouble because their parents would probably beat the hell out of them yeah uh, there you go the ring. yep Marine well, Marine Corps what, parents what happened, in those days in those days if your kids screwed up in town the the, the commanding officer would call you into his office and tell you about your kids. You 
you know, so, uh, you know, they couldn't go out and drink or, you know, any of that stuff. So it was, uh, it was getting difficult. My daughter here is telling me that we're running out of time. So oh, okay. A very important question. Uh, yeah, my wife just passed away a year ago, so if any young, beautiful 35-year-old women are out there, give them my number. <laughs> okay, well, there, there's plenty of them out there uh, there. Check their bank account first, too. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move back that through it now. I, I had the I had a bills portion, but I'm gonna go skip right to basically post career. And uh, if there's yeah. anything that you wanted to talk about, again, I, I have on your your uh, dirtiest player thing. I have on they call me dirty with the with that you wrote with Vic Carucci. What what does Conrad Dobler do nowadays to keep active? You you were talking about the fact that you give out shots and things like that so yeah well I, I i still do that and i just recently uh after my wife passed i uh kind of sold my house i didn't need a big house like that and i uh i really didn't know what i was gonna do i had six children and uh to tell you the truth i'm still trying to figure it out well still trying to figure out what I, I, i'm gonna do the rest of my life because she was a louisiana girl and uh she, she was a, she, you know worked right with me and stuff because she was also a nurse Right. There were times when we well, there were times we were doing bad, you know, you know, most people think they played in professional sports. Uh you never have to work again in your life. Well, not when I played. Uh and he really helped it a lot by taking a lot of shifts at hospital. She was my senior nurse. Well, sir, I I, I I definitely appreciate you being here. And again, I take a, a, a taken away from your family time that to be here with me. It's very, very yeah. much well, appreciated. She broke, she broke her neck and I took care of her for fifteen years she was in a wheelchair. And uh, and you want to know what? It wasn't all that hard. Yeah, I you know, I, I when, you read, love, when you love somebody, you know, it's not hard to do things for. Them. Right. I I read that in the bio, and again, uh, blessings and and uh, condolences uh, your way for that. And the fact that uh, you know, I read about the the bills being a bitch, and that uh, Phil Mickelson came through and and helped out your kids as well, which was awesome. But again, you you deserved it, and and. Uh, you know, I, I tell you what, for folks that are watching, there is nobody that's been nicer and more uh, uh, affording to give their time than, than uh, Mr. Conrad Dobler. And I, and I appreciate that, sir. Well, I, I hope you do, because my daughter, who sits in dinner, I don't think she appreciates it. She's going to be the old circle hand and uh, like wrap it up here. Yeah. And, and we can't, we'll wrap it up today. We'll finish it tomorrow. But, uh, well, I appreciate you saying those things. But you want to know what? I can't imagine why anyone wouldn't do that. You, you know, when you get married, you have responsibilities. When you have children, you have responsibilities. Why would you shirk on those? There you go. And and so again, Miss Dober, I will let you get back to your family. You can tell your daughter that the old the old salty bastard is hearing her saying, "Wrap it up." She can hear you. She can hear you, but I don't think she's buying it. <laughs> I, I swear. I swear. Do, do, do. I'll give you two of your last two questions. What are they? Uh, again, uh, your your uh, time with Dan Dorador, if we didn't get a chance to, to talk about Dan very much. Oh, well, Dan, you know, Dan is just a, you know, what people want. I tell you, we had such a tight-knit offensive line. We're still friends today. Tom Banks went to Auburn. I went to Wyoming. We had a guy from, uh, Ernie, we had Ernie McMillan there and Dan Dorador from Michigan and uh, Jim Hennepin. Just to, to this day, we're still great friends. You know, I can call him up and say, listen, you know, I, I need this or that, and, and he'd do it. Or when I did, I had my own radio show for five years in St. Louis. Was it in St. Louis? No, Kansas City, Kansas City. Uh, he didn't mind doing interviews with me. And I'd call him up when when there was no telephone calls and stuff like that. I'd have my um, engineer say, he called this number. <laughs> and he'd call him. And when we went to a break, he said, how much longer? I said, well, how much longer have you got? He said, yeah, I'll do whatever you want. So. We had a tight knit group there that we're still friends today. There's only three of us left. Bob Young has passed, and Roger Finney has passed. So there's just Dan, myself, and uh, Tom. And we all thought Tom meant to go first. He's a wild man, but he's still with us. Then I think the last thing, I, and since you gave me two, I'm going to ask this, and I swear I'll shut up. Do you recall any games against the Raiders and, and how they were for you? Well, you know, I've been against the Raiders in the past, but I went to the Buffalo. Guess who my roommate was? My roommate was Phil Bill Piano. There you go. And and, uh, and and of course, in New York, the bars never closed. That was the first time I got around with that. So Phil and I were out in Buffalo together, and uh, and we, uh, you know, I I left the one year before they got that big, 
you know, going to say to one guy, you know. And uh, Phil could have uh, thrown like, you know, you played two more years than me, but you were there in Buffalo when every player, when they put the collective bargaining agreement years ago, every player you got a bonus for like $10,000. Just, you know, we'll give you that, you got your contract, and leave it alone. And I, and I didn't get one because, you know, I was hired and stuff. And Phil says, I said, well, you got one. He said, well, no, I didn't. I said, why? He said, because I got divorced and my wife got that. My <laughs> wife got that. So I said, well, too bad. But, but hey, you were there. And again, Conrad, I, uh, sir, I, it's been a pleasure. And I'll get with you another time because I definitely would love to have a, a copy of, of that shot of you uh, in my collection for memorabilia. Because I'm a fan, first of all. And I, I do remember you from there, from, from playing, for sure. Yeah, I do, I do appreciate that. And I'll tell you what, it was, it was, uh, it was like that, the two, two lifetimes. Uh, one when I was that person, one when I was this person. I executive, I own my own company. We shopped around the nation for large companies. And uh, that's what I do now. And I'm always thinking about maybe I would just close it down and retire, but I can't imagine not having anything to do. I was raised, you know, when my parents worked till the day we put them in the ground. And I just can't understand what people do when they retire. Well, you do yeah, it. Do. I, I have no one to do it with. Well, and, the thing is, I, and I don't have the stamina to go find one because it's just so hard. <laughs> You have to be good for so long. Well, you you continue to do what you do, sir, because again, we enjoy you. And uh, any any other time, and and I guarantee you, I don't know how often you get out to Florida, but if you ever get out my neck of the woods, we'll go out and we'll we'll celebrate uh, again. You going into the priesthood because you told me that earlier before yeah, we were yeah, on, on yeah, the I show. Know, I, I, as I said, how can you, how can they call me dirty? I was a cardinal. There you go. And, and, and a great cardinal at that. I have to go to Rome next week for the uh, conclave. <laughs> anyway, I... Watch for the white smoke. Wow. Yeah, well, I, I got it. Watch for the white smoke, man. You know what the, You know what that means. Yeah, I do. There but you go. Be good and see your audience out there in Florida or wherever this uh, conversation is going. Have a great time. And Captain Jack is just as good to be as Captain Morgan. There you go. And and I will try to be better, sir, because I'll at least be buying the Captain Morgan when I see him. Yeah, well, I, I hope you uh, we'll get to do it. I'm a big Scotch fan now. Okay. Well, well, so my daughter is jabbing me with my own cane, telling me, hey, wrap it up and sit in our fingers. And, you know, so, like, hey, anyways, I enjoyed it to all your fans out there. Captain Jack is a good guy, man. He didn't try to ambush me like some of those people do. Unfortunately, they don't realize that. I'm actually a very smart man. Don't ambush me because I'll come right back and bury you. Yo, you're welcome. You're welcome anytime, sir. Take care of yourself. Thanks again. Tell your daughter I'm shutting up, and thanks for coming on, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Bye bye. Hi, right, bye bye. And and for folks that were wondering, uh, let me let me get the the line here so I can. Uh, I'm trying to find the phone line here. I have it here somewhere. But anyway, I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, if I can't find a phone line, I'll still say this to everybody that's here. Thanks again for joining me on another Black Shield and Galleon Wheel webcast. We'll see you next time where, where we have some more guests. Bob Grant will be on next Wednesday, and we have further uh, folks coming on later on as well. So y'all take care. We'll see you next time. It's Captain Jack out. I'm this up.